Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, on behalf of Pete Eichler and I, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Old Westbury and to the students of Old Westbury and to the broader community uh, listening to our talk today entitled The Racial Economics of Mass Incarceration, a Defense and Extension of Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. Published in 2010, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander sparked a national conversation about American jail and prison systems. Just two years previously, the United States made history electing Barack Obama the first black president. While many saw his ascendancy to the highest position in the country as a shift in America, some even stating the United States was now quote unquote post-racial, Alexander's book crushes that notion, rightly pointing out the disproportionate amount of black Americans inside the American criminal justice system. Beyond simply the number of black people inside jails and prisons, Alexander points out the millions of people who are negatively impacted by the criminal conviction which creates collateral consequences post-incarceration from taking employment opportunities away, banned political participation, and so social stigmas attached to being known as a quote-unquote felon. In sum, Alexander, using a critical race and legal lens theory, argues convincingly that the laws and policies enacted in the second half of the 20th century into the first decade of the 21st century systematically targeted specific demographics and populations, creating a racial caste system, or rather a racial underclass. In sum, a whole stratum of people who would be politically, economically, and socially disenfranchised in the United States, reminiscent of late 19th and early 20th century policies known as Jim Crow. Unlike earlier forms of overt racism, the later policies were enacted and created with a covert colorblind racism that attempted to replace race with criminality to justify punishments. Alexander's work has sold well over a million copies, generating conversations from the family dinner table to national politicians having to reckon with America's problem of incarceration. While Alexander was far from the first to discuss the issue or address many of the consequences of incarceration, her work was able to capture a much broader audience than the standard academic reader. In the last 10 years, Alexander's work has received mostly praise with a whole new generation of undergraduate and graduate students reading this book. Yet, like with all work, there have been detractors and critics of Alexander. Two of those critics are John Clegg and Adner Usmani. In their article entitled, The Economic Origins of Mass Incarceration, published by Catalyst in fall 2019, the pair attempt to correct what they believe Alexander's work misses and what they deem as the quote unquote standard story of mass incarceration. The duo take issue with historical logic surrounding race, punishment, and policy and deliver a revisionist understanding of how America's unique position with carcerality, otherwise known as mass incarceration, occurred. When Clegg and Usmani's article was published, some pockets and circles on the left praised this work as, quote unquote, a fresh look on America's use of captivity. Moving away from their standard story, as they put, they argue that mass incarceration simply occurs because of the lack of black absorption into the northern labor market and because of the rise of crime in the mid 20th century. Thus, cities and states simply responded almost uniformly but spontaneously the same by using punitive force in expanding jail and prison systems. Today, Dr. Peter Eichler and I will discuss a response article to Clegg and Usmani's work that was recently published in the Spectre Journal. We found several issues with their arguments stemming from inconsistent and unreliable methodology, a revisionist and erasure of historical occurrences, and an incomplete analysis surrounding mass incarceration. Cool, thank you, Calvin. Uh, and I wanna thank Svetlana and Old Westbury for organizing this, uh, this talk today for everybody uh, to, who turned out. Um, so as Calvin pointed out, what we're presented with by this article by uh, um, John Clegg and Adana Usmani is um, essentially a class reductionist argument about the rise of imprisonment in the late 20th century US. Um, so what we're gonna lay out are first off, a series of claims from their argument, which may also be shared by other uh, 
class reductionist arguments um, and what they get wrong um, and how, where they fall flat. Um, so first, before we dive into each one after the other, um, let's first just lay these out and indicate our um, uh, contrary responses to them. So number one, mass incarceration did not coincide with rising racial disparity. This is a claim from their article, um, and we will argue that, yes, in fact, it did. Two, that the war on drugs uh, was not an important factor for the rise of late 20th century imprisonment. That is a central claim from Alexander's work. It's one that is disputed by Clegg and Usmani. We will argue that, yes, in fact, it was an important factor. Number three, they're going to say that public punitiveness, which is their term for rising public attitudes or public opinion in favor of get, get tough on crime policies, um, uh, in favor of um, uh, carceral um, uh, detention, that this was simply a reflection of rising crime. The crime was rising in the 60s and 70s, and with it, pretty much automatically, um, people became more punitive as a response to it. We will argue that no, in fact, it wasn't. This relationship is not so simple and not so direct. Number four, um, class reductionists argue that U.S. imprisonment is simply a reflection of two other exceptionalisms in America, high crime and low welfare, right? That the U.S. has a, had a very high crime rate compared to other countries of its peer um, and also a low level of uh, uh, welfare redistribution and that incarceration also being high is just a, a sort of trade-off from these, the flip side of the coin to those two um, uh, anomalies. We will argue that, no, it's not. Number five, um, Clegg and Usmani argue that federalism, the structure of our uh, uh, national government, meant or means that states could do little else besides lock up people as a response to crime, that they were limited in terms of the social redistribution they could undertake as a more positive or supportive response. We will argue that federalism was, uh, uh, did not mean this, it did not pose such a barrier um, uh, and require states to lock people up. Last but not least, um, class reductionists, in this case, argue that poverty in the black community in the post-war period, 1950s, 60s, 70s, was mainly due overwhelmingly to inherited economic deficits. The past influence of slavery and Jim Crow meant that when they got to um, northern cities or even southern cities in some cases or left rural areas, um, that they simply came with, uh, a, with very little wealth um, and uh, uh, certifiable skills that could be put to use in getting jobs and accumulating wealth. And also that there was poor timing, right? That they just arrived in these cities at the same time as factory jobs were winding down or, or decreasing. We will argue that no, past economic deficits were not the main or the only cause of post-war black poverty. Um, which uh, Clegg and Usmani argue did not rise um, uh, in correlation with the prison boom of the late 20th century. Um, these are their graphs. They present these in their article. So we're just looking at their own data. Um, and they mainly point to the first one, which shows uh, that uh, basically a very steep curve for the high school dropout to college grad ratio of who's getting locked up, who's getting incarcerated, versus the black to white ratio, which is the one at the bottom. And they derive from this figure the claim that only uh, class disparities rose um, with the rise of incarceration, not racial disparities. However, we should clearly look at that bottom uh, uh, line, which does in fact go up significantly um, between the, uh, it's already rising in the 70s, but it goes up sharply in the 1980s from about five to one to seven to one in a 10 year period, um, which is the prime era of the prison boom. Um, so racial disparity did in fact rise in incarceration at the same time as incarceration was booming. So that claim initially falls flat. But even more uh, significant are the other disaggregated charts that they provide in the bottom corner, which breaks down education groups. Um, and there we can see in every single group a growing racial disparity, not growing in the last, but growing uh, 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 in the first three, between black and white incarceration. It's most pronounced among those who do not have a high school uh, degree, where it just soars among uh, black people and edges up a little bit uh, among white people. Um, it's still there among those who have uh, um, uh, uh, some college, um, and uh, sorry, among who have a high school uh, degree. It's also still there among uh, uh, some college grads and those who have a four-year college degree, even among them, black people are about twice as likely to be imprisoned 
as their white counterparts, right? So racial disparity is still there. It just gets a little bit smaller across the educational spectrum. And all of this happens at the same time as the prison movement. So that's claim one. Let's take a look at claim two. Um, Clegg and Usmani argue that uh, drug convictions, which are a big part of Alexander's argument that the war on drugs was a sort of um, uh, a cover for a, a war against black people. Um, they argue that drug convictions themselves or the war on drugs did not play a big role in uh, uh, the prison boom. Um, and their, their evidence for that is the fact that in 2019, last year, only, only 21% of current prisoners were in for drug crimes. However, we would on the face of it argue that 21% is kind of a lot, right? That's more than one out of every five. It's more than uh, the number of prisoners who are in the proportion who are in for uh, property crimes. Of course, smaller than those are, who are in for violent crimes. But on the face of it, we would just say, okay, a fifth is not easily negligible as a, a sort of marginal factor in imprisonment trends. However, we would go a step deeper. There's an important distinction to make between stock of prisoners at any given time, who's in for what crime, versus the flow of prisoners in and out of prison, right? If you expand the time frame and don't just look at a snapshot, you can, you can track what are the convictions that are causing people to come in, stay in, and or then leave prison. And that's actually a more accurate depiction of what's causing prisons to fill up. Now, Clegg and Usmani, interestingly, actually acknowledge this distinction in a footnote to a different chart that's not related to this question. They explicitly acknowledge that there's a distinction between stock versus flow. However, uh, they do not take that into account when considering the role for drug crime convictions. So let's consider. In the years between 1993 and 2009, prime years for the prison expansion, um, uh, Rothwell, an author uh, uh, who we cite, um, finds uh, uh, using uh, Bureau, of Bureau of Justice Statistics data that 31% of all new prison admissions were due to drug crimes. It was actually a plurality of the total. Um, furthermore, we want to take into account that two thirds of all prisoners and three quarters of drug crime prisoners have a uh, go back to prison within five years of release, right? So this is part of the process of imprisonment. Getting imprisoned generates a much greater likelihood of going back to prison. So if we expand that out and say, okay, um, let's, be, let's be generous. Only two thirds of that 31% who went in for drug crimes um, will go back to prison, unfortunately, within five years, maybe for another crime that's not coded as a drug crime. However, we could clearly argue that getting admitted the first time contributed to that. So it's pretty easy to see that within that frame, it's, it's not hard to get to a majority, in fact, of prison admissions due to directly or indirectly to drug crimes using this distinction between stock and flow, uh, which is important. So that's so much for claim two. Claim three, uh, people in America, this is mainly that second chart that they provide there with the two curves, um, uh, we're becoming more punitive, more supportive of tough on crime policies, including imprisonment. So these again are charts that um, the authors that we are criticizing provide in their write up. And this is a quote from them. Crime victimization coincided with high and often rising inequalities with African Americans disproportionately likely to be both offenders and victims. Okay. Um, they derive from this the idea, uh, a simple reflection of crime was rising, seen in the first graphs, Therefore, attitudes towards crime or punitiveness rose in sync. There's a problem here, however. If we look at the attitude charts, the two uh, seemingly normal curves there, um, we can see that there's a persistent racial gap. Whites are, throughout the entire time period, more punitive than black folks. And their curve also rises sooner. It's steeper at the beginning. Um, however, the same authors also acknowledge that white people were far less and actually in decreasingly less likely to be exposed to crime during the same period. So it doesn't really hold up to say that people's attitudes were becoming more punitive because they were being exposed to crime when the people less exposed to crime and decreasingly so were getting sooner and um, more often punitive than those who were more exposed uh, uh, to crime. Therefore, the simple relationship of um, crime to punitiveness does not hold up uh, uh, very well either. Uh, that was claim three, but now we're on to claim four. Claim four is a little bit more complex. Um, Clegg and Usmani argue in a couple of ways that the U.S. is exceptional with regard to having very high crime in the mid to late 20th century and very low welfare compared to its advanced capitalist peers, places like Japan, France, Austria, Sweden, Germany, Switzerland, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Right? 
um, and more broadly, um, often codified as the OECD countries. So they give us these graphs. For example, they show the US at the bottom of the social spending to penal spending basket there, right? They're about 12 to one in that year, whereas the OECD average is 22 to one. And on the other bottom corner graph, they show that the US is towards the bottom of the pack when it comes to um, the social transfers, basically welfare transfers as a proportion of GDP. So the US is kind of um, uh, trailing on these fronts, right? The US doesn't spend that much on social welfare compared to other advanced capitalist countries, right? This is not really news, but we, we know this already. Um, now let's take a look at the next, uh, the next slide. The interesting thing, however, um, is that while the US is a little bit at the bottom of the normal range for its uh, welfare generosity or lack thereof, it's totally off the charts when it comes to incarceration. Here are some of the other countries um, that are roughly economic peers uh, to the US. And these are their incarceration rates in 2018 per 100,000 people in the country, right? Japan is at the very low end. Um, England and Wales is at the high end of the normal spectrum. Um, but the US is completely off the charts. It towers over every other uh, peer economic country. And it also, um, which are not depicted here, towers over the rates for Russia, for Brazil, uh, uh, for Iran, um, uh, and for China. China is about 164 uh, um, uh, in prisoners per 100,000 population. So the claim that the US is just a little bit more meager in welfare, therefore it's um, uh, ridiculously off the charts in incarceration doesn't really hold up. They're kind of false equivalencies. Go to the next slide. Um, Another point sort of related to that, um, saying that the U.S. has an anomalous, uh, you know, very unusual burst of crime in the mid to late 20th century um, actually is undermined by a key text, um, a very detailed empirically based uh, uh, book by uh, Franklin Zimmering and Gordon Hawkins, whom Clegg and Usmani in their article approvingly cite. They're aware of this work. They praise it. Um, they don't actually deal with uh, the arguments within it or the data that it presents. But the central argument of this text is that the US crime rate or crime wave, as it's often called, is really not exceptional among advanced capitalist countries. Other countries had similar waves of crime in the mid to late 20th century. The only big difference they find is that the US crime wave is more often lethal because there are more firearms in the US and more easily obtained. Therefore, crime which in other places may have been convict, you know, committed with a knife or uh, um, a, a, maybe a single shot weapon um, uh, or other less lethal uh, uh, weapon could in the US more often be carried out with um, you know, high capacity assault rifles and therefore generate much more violence and death and more serious uh, uh, penalties perhaps. Um, so that's another thing that they don't engage with. The, the high crime rate in the US is really not that exceptional um, based on work that they um, acknowledge exists. The fifth of these six claims that we're gonna try and break down is this idea that the federalist structure of the US is a barrier to social solutions to crime rather than penal solutions to crime. So here's a quote that they give. The perverse consequence of American federalism is that it is those areas in which violence concentrates that have the least resources to fight it. The costs of fleeing the federal state are much higher than the costs of fleeing local taxes since the rich only have to jump across jurisdictional boundaries, i.e. or e.g. move to the suburbs. Okay, um, there's a first issue here. Uh, states are bigger than localities, right? So a state, New York, Pennsylvania, California, take your pick, usually includes um, the suburbs of a, of a central city as well as the central city itself. Um, so this idea that the rich can just flee to the suburbs to flee state taxes doesn't really hold up, at least in most cases. Um, so that's a, a sort of smaller problem. Bigger problem, however, is that um, the essence of federalism is parity between the states or the subordinate units and the larger entity, the country. Um, states actually have taxation and distribution powers that are equal to the federal government. There's many things they can do. They can tax wealth, property, income, uh, uh, sales. They can uh, raise minimum wages, and many do. Even many localities have the power to raise minimum wages above the national level uh, or even above their state's level for the case of cities. Um, they can legalize certain activities that could generate more revenue, right? Cannabis, we're seeing that right now, uh, sex work, gambling. These are all activities that are in many places illegal, but in some states or even some localities legalized, and those are often heavily taxed and generate more revenue for the state. Um, states can do a lot of things. Actually, Clegg and Usmani acknowledge this. They state at the end of their consideration here, 
that states do attempt to craft their own social policies. They can raise taxes and they can spend in redistributive ways. We would conclude from this that federalism, which they claim is a barrier, is actually not a barrier. Um, it doesn't predetermine that states can only lock people up. They did have other options at their disposal. They just predominantly did not make use of them. Last of these uh, six questionable claims that we're going to unpack here um, is the idea that Clayton is money raised that post-war black poverty, which they see as a precursor to the crime wave, um, was largely due to uh, inherited disadvantage rather than active discrimination. So here are just some of the things they say. Um, I'm quoting Clegg and money here. Uh, Cities were failing to absorb the black peasantry. American labor and housing markets were in no state to absorb the new migrants, meaning black folks who moved from the South or from rural areas. While the first wave of migrants from the South had largely been absorbed into industrial jobs, the second wave was invariably less likely to find work. So repeatedly we get this metaphor of absorption as if northern cities or even southern metro areas were just sort of like saturated paper towels that just it couldn't soak up any more people, right? Um, unfortunately, this conception or this depiction uh, flies in the face of a large mountain of research that shows that active discrimination, specifically in housing, but not only in housing, played a very, very big role in excluding um, black people in the post-war era from the prosperity of the post-war boom, um, restricting them from moving to the suburbs, restricting them from getting the industrial and other jobs that were often also moving to the suburbs, restricting their educational opportunities, restricting their ability to accumulate wealth through purchasing a house. Um, here are just some of the major works that document this. Um, probably the most well-known is that by uh, Massey and Denton, American Apartheid, published in 1992. Um, but there's also more recent work from Kianga Yamada Taylor, from Richard Rothstein, um, among many others that um, in painstakingly detail the role of active discrimination in housing and other areas in generating post-war black poverty. So it was not just inherited disadvantage, it was an active force operating on the basis of race to exclude people from, uh, uh, from wealth. And so when we look at um, one of the areas that Clegg and Usmani seem to want to reduce down to a simple, um, to a simple uh, snapshot, we really have to take a more robust uh, issue with the timeline of black oppression in the United States. So when we think about the history of America's relationship with people of African descent, it is uniquely different than any other, uh, say, immigrant, quote unquote, uh, population. As black people uh, throughout uh, the history or black people's uh, relationship with the United States, have been held in various institutions of captivity, which um, was through uh, use of exploited labor amongst other aspects of black life. So first, as many of us uh, know, uh, slavery, which existed from roughly 1619 till 1865, literally held black people as chattel or rather as uh, property. The second area that I wanted to take a little bit more time to uh, unpack is uh, something that uh, Clegg and Usmani seem to almost uh, ignore. And they say in their piece, um, quote, most of the growth in the ratio of black to white incarceration occurred in an earlier period of American history, 1880 to 1970, after the end of slavery and during the first great migration. So they, they acknowledge, uh, but simultaneously downplay the significance of this period and don't even name it. Um, this time period known as convict leasing um, really uh, put black people in a position that was mirroring um, uh, the institution of slavery. And so African-American historian and sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in his book, Black Reconstruction, published in 1935, quote, this penitentiary system began to characterize the whole South. In Georgia, at the outbreak of the Civil War, there were about 200 white felons confined at Midgeville Prison. There were no Negro convicts, since under the discipline of slavery, Negroes were punished on the plantation. The white convicts were released to fight in the Confederate Army. The whole criminal justice system came to be understood as a method of keeping Negroes at work and intimidating them. Consequently, there began to be a demand for jails and penitentiaries beyond their natural demand. So what we see during this time period is a, a, a literal growth of a system that, uh, first of all, was uh, entirely corrupt as 
everyone from local uh, constables and sheriffs to lawyers to judges to private industries uh, profited from this convict leasing system, which would use various black codes and other kind of discriminatory uh, laws to keep black people uh, essentially in chains. So during this uh, Jim Crow era, black people literally uh, went from slaves to convicts. And the, chat and the status change was almost entirely in name alone. And the reason why this was uh, able to happen was when we look at the 13th Amendment, which granted emancipation and abolished slavery, it also had a captivity loophole as it reads, quote, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime where the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So historians and other scholars have uh, articulated how convicted persons suffer harsh, uh, uh, unsanitary and violent work conditions under the convict leasing era. And in this instance, it was also, and it could be argued that black life was actually uh, valued less than during slavery, because under slavery as chattel property, uh, slaves held an intrinsic economic value to the enslaver versus under convict leasing, where the only focus was what type of labor could be procured by those who were uh, held to this leasing system. So if someone died or could no longer work, um, it was simply the burden was put on the state to provide more um, workers to these private industries that were literally leasing uh, labor from the state based on a criminal conviction. And so when we now look at uh, fast forward mass incarceration, uh, as we all uh, might have heard, you know, into the 21st century, we have more than 2.3 million people in uh, jails and prisons. And as we've pointed out, uh, that that is disproportionate among the uh, Black people. And even today, we see overlap between past systems of slavery, convict leasing, and mass incarceration, particularly in the form of prison camps throughout the South that not only have a feel of plantation style uh, form of punishment, but in fact, we're built on former plantations. So uh, the Ramsey unit in Texas, the Cummins unit in Arkansas, and the notorious Louisiana State Prison, which is more commonly referred to as Angola, uh, still produces vegetables and meats for public consumption and hold an annual uh, rodeo uh, known as the prison rodeo, which puts prisoners in the spotlight for purposes of entertainment and gathering uh, income for the prison. So, Looking at that timeline leading up until mass incarceration, we start to see uh, uh, in the mid 20th century, the civil rights and black power movements. And these are really important in terms of their context that after uh, World War II, uh, black folks really had a, a rejuvenated um, um, you know, energy to not be seen as second class citizens. As I always teach in my classes, imagine being a black uh, soldier from uh, the deep south and going to uh, Italy or Northern Africa or the South Pacific and white folks are, uh, white women are hugging you and white men are saluting you and white children are, are, are singing your praises. And then you come back home and, into this Jim Crow system and you can't even get a cup of coffee because uh, coloreds are not allowed in. Or that if you look at a white woman the wrong way, you could, uh, your life could be lost or your house be burned down. So we see that with the civil rights movement, there's this rejuvenation and part of the goals of the civil rights movement is simply for equal rights and equal protection under the law. And we know that the majority of the civil rights movement occurs throughout the South. And many of those responses are by uh, uh, reactionary responses to the civil rights movement, as we've seen as through Ku Klux Klan and other forms of white terrorism. But it's also by uh, police and law enforcement. So on the left here, you see um, signs from a, a picket saying, oh, Pritchett, open themselves. Um, uh, legal to pick it and Albany police say so. Well, as we all have uh, probably seen the images of police dogs and fire hoses being used on uh, civil rights protesters and nonviolent protesters, uh, in an instance in 1961 in Albany, Georgia, known as the Albany Movement, the chief of police, Lori Pritchett, actually read Dr. King's book on nonviolence. And instead of uh, using fire hoses and, and dogs, he actually just met protesters with mass arrests and then charged them with um, uh, citations such as disturbing the police, excuse me, disturb disturbing the peace. And the police uh, actually in Albany, Georgia, earned wide praise 
uh, for their uh, use of this type of detention. So this moves us into what starts to occur in the mid 1960s, this law and order politics. So we start to hear politicians um, using this, that we have to get tough on crime. Well, black people were experiencing tough on crime before it even became rhetoric. And no other places do we see this occurring uh, throughout the uh, 60s as in northern cities as well. So oftentimes we only think of um, civil rights or the, or the fight for civil rights as a southern issue. But in many northern cities, uh, police were used as a, uh, as a violent agent of the state to kind of repress any type of black um, dissent. And as we see in uh, 1967, in both Detroit, Newark, and then other places, uh, National Guard is sent in. And as the picture on the right shows from the Newark Rebellion, where National Guard were actually um, you know, just shooting black people at will because of uh, rumors that there were uh, 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 snipers uh, waiting in the wings. And finally, all of this is uh, kind of umbrella with this idea of government infiltration into major uh, black movements and known as the COINTELPRO or counterintelligence program under J. Edgar Hoover, they infiltrated, uh, repressed, disturbed all different types of black movements. And uh, Chicago is a great example of where the FBI, along with the Chicago police, actually orchestrated the murder of a black Panther leader by the name of Fred Hampton. And prior to his murder, they actually had been sending um, uh, uh, fake letters to uh, gang leaders in Chicago, hoping that there'd be a lot of infighting between the Black Panthers and other uh, gangs. So we know that government uh, disturbance in trying to drum up a lot of this violence occurred. And we uh, can't be naive and think it only happened one time, as we know that the counterintelligence program started as early as the 1930s and was only kind of put to a stop because um, activists uh, uh, broke into a FBI uh, 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 room in, in, in Pennsylvania and found all the files. And so it brings us to this idea of the war on drugs. So coming out of the, of the 1960s with folks like um, Richard Nixon and then here, <clears throat> excuse me, in New York with Nelson Rockefeller, they really started to put um, drugs uh, no longer as a public health concern, but shifted it into a criminal justice uh, issue. So in 1973, Nelson Rockefeller here in New York passes one of the most um, a, um, expanded uh, and uh, uh, punitive uh, laws around drugs, creating mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines. And what this effectively does is it essentially takes away any type of Prosecu uh, prosecutorial discretion or uh, judicial um, discretion, because now um, prosecutors and judges can no longer take into context someone's background, have they ever been in trouble before, uh, et cetera. And all they're looking at is the type of uh, drugs or the amount of drugs they have, and that then is equivalent to a particular sentence. So we've seen cases, for example, there's a great book about a woman named Elan Bar Bartlett, who was a, or who is a black woman from Harlem who had never been in trouble with the law and in the mid 80s, uh, you know, brought uh, uh, a package of cocaine upstate. It was a sting operation and she was given a life sentence and served 16 years before being released. So, uh, you know, and what starts to happen in the, in, uh, in the 70s into the 80s and 90s is the states and federal government almost try to outdo each other and who can be more punitive. So we see this rise in punitive punishment, so three strikes rules, truth and sentencing uh, uh, guidelines. In the 1980s, we see um, uh, uh, Nancy Reagan and Just Say No, Crack is Whack, right? This is still um, a mural up in Harlem. On the right-hand side, uh, Governor Chris, uh, uh, Christy Todd Whitman in New Jersey went on a ride-along in the early 90s, and uh, this uh, infamous picture of her patting down just a, 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 a random black guy. This guy really wasn't even an arrest. The cops just pulled this black guy over just for this photo op, right? But again, this kind of rise in punitive uh, punishments. And then finally, this brings us to law enforcement incentives, which kind of brings it whole to what Pete was saying earlier around um, when police agencies would uh, seize, uh, whether it was weapons, money, cars, whatever, they could actually keep that. Um, they were also then getting special grants from the federal government to go out and make these crime arrests uh, based on uh, drug offenses, et cetera. So it incentivized 
local and state agencies to go out there and just make these arrests. And uh, with that, they got higher grade uh, weaponry, um, uh, um, uh, uh, military kind of tactical training. And this is what we see now, everything from Ferguson to uh, Minneapolis uh, this past summer with these kind of uh, uh, soldier looking police that are roaming the streets and, and, and stopping uh, protesters. Okay. Um... So just one last sort of major area of critique um, that we, we're going to sort of bring against the class reductionist argument and before we sort of move towards the outline of an alternative. Um, and that is something that first struck me. I, mean, I remember the first time that I read Alexander, it was probably 2012, 2013, um, a little bit late to the game. And I remember reading it and sort of having this like insight as if like, wow, okay, so the same political reaction against uh, the gains of the civil right and black power movements was taking shape at almost the exact same time as another um, governmental uh, uh, offensive um, on behalf of capital, on behalf of big corporations, was also taking shape. What many people call uh, the neoliberal offensive, or the period that was really inaugurated fully with Reagan, uh, uh, the neoliberal era, or neoliberalism, right? It was a, a dramatic shift um, in the sort of economic architecture and, and style of the U.S. government um, and, and uh, institutions towards a much more free market, uh, um, a worker unfriendly, deregulatory uh, um, mode of, of organization. And it's not just a figment of the left's imagination, but we can actually clearly point to key indices that support this trend, right? So one of the most obvious ones is the first graph here, right? Which shows uh, hourly compensation basically following productivity for all the years up until about the mid seventies, and then it totally decouples from it. Um, we can look at the minimum wage in the real dollars, the yellow line, basically rising until again, the early 70s, and then totally flatlining until today. It's lower today in real terms than it was um, in the late 60s. We can also look at um, the total, you know, almost exact uh, uh, playoff between unionization um, as, it's, uh, as a total uh, membership rate in the economy um, among the workforce to uh, uh, income inequality or the share of income going to the top 10%. So as unions declined, the uh, uh, share of wealth uh, and share of income going to the top increased and it's uh, um, yeah, no problem. that it's a, a direct trade-off. Um, so I saw this you know years ago as something that would be a great um, combination uh, with uh, Alexander's uh, uh, theory and proposal and that seems totally synonymous with it okay that a reaction against a certain section of the po section of the population was happening at the same time as a reaction against uh, the working class was happening. Um, Interestingly, uh, the class reductionist argument, which you would think would want to discuss this, would want to bring this to the fore um, uh, and talk about changes in the economy and changes in um, the, the balance of class power in the U.S., um, is completely unmentioned uh, in this, at least in this version, Clegg and Usmani's version of uh, uh, the class reductionist argument. Um, they don't bring it up. They don't talk about uh, the massive changes that happen in the U.S. economy and political structure post. Uh, uh, 1980 or from 1980 onward, um, which, you know, to us sort of signifies a, a rather simplistic view of causation, right, or how things happen in historical perspective that, you know, a series of economic processes were set in motion in the 50s and 60s, maybe in the 70s, and they just kind of played out, like right? they played out in mass incarceration over the next 30 years. Um, meanwhile, the economy itself and the relations between class groups were undergoing themselves seismic change. Um, so that's just one more piece of the puzzle that we want to bring uh, uh, to the critique here before moving towards uh, something a bit more um, uh, constructive, a bit more synthetic. Um, now, what we don't offer here, we don't have the final, you know, furbished, uh, 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 polished theory uh, uh, that we're going to present here. What we're going to present is the, an outline of a theory or how we might make steps towards that, an integrated theory that is neither class reductionist nor race reductionist. And to be perfectly clear, we do not consider Alexander to be race reductionist, right? She mainly emphasizes race and racially charged politics in explaining mass incarceration, which is largely in line with her expertise as a legal scholar. Um, but she also clearly leaves room and in some places explicitly states the role of class dynamics and forces both within the black community and outside of it uh, as, as part of the puzzle, right? She just doesn't fully flesh those parts out. Clegg and Usmani, however, are explicitly class reductionist. Their entire argument is essentially designed to deflate and, and reject racial political explanations. So how can we bring an integrated theory uh, uh, to the fore? Um, we will argue that it has something to do with changes in the makeup of the wage labor force, right, which we see a very multicolored, confusing chart here below. 
Um, let me just briefly explain that before we go on to the more argumentative part. This is um, basically a chart of labor force participation. So everybody who's 16 years or older in the US who theoretically could have a job, how many people are actually, or, or be self-employed, how many people are actually participating in the formal economy, right? That's that rate, right? Uh, overall, that rate went up. That's the middle blue line, right? That's everybody uh, that went up uh, until about the uh, mid or late 90s. And then it sort of plateaued and has actually gone down since. The male rate has gone steadily down from almost 90% over the whole period. The female rate went up and then also plateaued. And then we can also see breakdowns by white men, white women, black men, black women, right? Um, we're going to make an argument that, you know, uh, uh, builds upon these uh, sort of macro trends over the whole post-war period. So here is steps toward that argument. And again, this is not a completed theory, but it's outlines of one. Um, we want to put forward seven claims uh, uh, that uh, start to build such a, uh, a conception. We would start, we'd have to go back a bit in history, as Calvin already did, and look at the social construction of race, right? That's sort of one of the founding uh, 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 things that we, of course, always teach and need to understand that race is, is itself a social construction. It's not a biological fact. Uh, it's not some, you know, given uh, um, um, physiological characteristic. It's a socially constructed uh, set of group relations. And we would say that race as we know it in America was constructed in colonial America, right, prior to the American Revolution, um, as on the one hand, a relationship of production, um, and on the other hand, also relationship of reproduction. So relationship of production is who gets forced into slavery and forced to perform certain kinds of work. Um, and reproduction is, of course, uh, um, you know, because it was focused on phenotypic traits, primarily skin color, that um, slave state laws became hyper-focused on uh, proportions of certain ancestry, preventing miscegenation, all these, these things, right? Um, that it was a sort of uh, a dualistic um, type of social relation. Two, what about class, right? Classes are also social constructions, right? They're not biological categories. They're not given to us, right? Hunter-gatherers, as far as we know, didn't have social classes, right? At least not in any uh, obvious way. Um, and clearly predates um, the rise of capitalism um, and at least predates in some form uh, the creation of uh, uh, racial, racial groups in America. Um, but it takes a specific form under capitalism, right? We have different types of classes under capitalism, right? Primarily wage workers, capital owners, self-employed, right? Some would say a professional managerial class, then in feudalism, then in uh, other pre-capitalist uh, eras, and also to a certain extent, then the slave state South. Three, the great migration, right? Um, the mass movement of millions of black people from the rural South uh, to the North and to the uh, uh, cities in the South. Um, what that effectively does is it withdraws black labor from non-wage areas, right? People were mainly working in sharecropping, were heavily oppressed, right? Um, under, but under different relationships of production and brings them into capitalist wage labor or the search for it, um, which was often, all too often a fruitless search um, and integrates this massive group into uh, 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 the sort of capitalist system proper, right? All right, no disagreement yet with Clegg and his money, at least on that front, right? They, they state that and that's, that's not up for debate really. Four, the slowing industrial growth um, that was happening in the post-war period, right? Factories were just not employing as many people for a number of reasons, um, plus the active discrimination that was going on in housing and employment. What this did was it racialized the post-war labor market. It, it increasingly, over the 50s, 60s, 70s, racialized unemployment, right? Made it in more and more a black phenomenon. Whereas prior to the, to the Second World War, that was largely unknown. It was not a, a large phenomenon of black people being you know, uh, stereotyped as the unemployed, right? But that became a phenomenon after that due to active discrimination. In the 70s, a new government ideology, governmentality uh, uh, system comes to the fore, which we've called neoliberalism, um, combined with a deepening industrial fallout, the mass uh, uh, dismantling of industry in the late 70s, early 80s, in many, many cities and towns across the Midwest and elsewhere um, that you know, had horrible social consequences for whole regions. And that this shift both in the economic base and in the uh, political orientation of uh, national leadership sets the stage either for a massive expansion of social programs, right? Um, or for harsh repression to discipline and sort of disappear um, large sectors of people that they know uh, uh, cannot be gainfully employed uh, under current parameters or under capitalist uh, incentives. So 
what Michelle Alexander does is she explains, she gives us the convincing narrative of how that second option was taken. The political processes that made harsh depression um, uh, the outcome that was chosen rather than the prior option, right, in this context. Um, we would just add and extend to her argument that three other factors overdetermined that this was going to be what happened. Overdetermined that the, incar the carceral answer, the lock em up answer, was going to take much more precedence over the socially redistributive answer to uh, uh, the problems facing the country in the 1970s. These three things were the new neoliberal orientation of, uh, uh, of elected officials and business leaders that was being actively promoted. Two, long-term industrial decline, right? Uh, uh, the waning of jobs within the industrial core um, due to many reasons, some of which are automation, some of which are offshoring, right? Um, it's another conversation. And three, due to the racialization of unemployment that was going on in the post-war era prior to the 70s due to uh, active discrimination combined with uh, uh, past uh, uh, deficits, right? The two uh, uh, work together to exclude black people from the boom that happened um, in prosperity in the post-war years. So what this leads us towards is a conception of US mass incarceration, essentially as a racialized class control project. Um, and there's much more to be sort of fleshed out and uh, polished off in, in terms of creating a theory out of these, these elements, but um, that's how uh, we would work to extend uh, Alexander's work um, and to um, uh, refute a class reductionist argument. Thank you very much. Yay. Uh, thank you, Kellen. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you so much for this. I think we could keep this slide, if you don't mind, for a few more moments for people to uh, maybe write down your contact uh, if they want to reach out. Um, so <clears throat> we have. Um, all right, let's say that we definitely have 10 minutes left. I'm aware that some people have a class at 4.50, so we will keep that as the ultimate um, um, end time um, of this meeting. So I would like to open um, the session for your questions. Um, and I, since I know that there are multiple students here, maybe I would just kind of encourage students to come out with their, to kind of take the questions from the students first um, before we open it to um, the rest of the, uh, what is the equivalent of the rest of this cyber room? Um, I still need to switch my language to this remote um, world. So do we have any questions? Anyone? And at this point, um, maybe I can, what I will do actually, I will open, um, I will, yes, allow uh, chat again so people can communicate that way as well. All right, so while the students are um, uh, gathering courage to ask questions, uh, we do have um, um, other questions and comments. So Lana, please go ahead if you want to share um, your, um, your comment. Great. First, I just want to say thank you. That was really fantastic. I appreciate you pulling such a, a huge scholarly debate into such a tight, nice little package. So really excellent work on that. I appreciate it. Um, in terms of your, you know, steps towards an uh, integrated theory, I think the, the bullets that you have there do a nice job of talking about like arrest rates and repression and zero tolerance policing. But I think also one of the key aspects of mass incarceration is the dramatic expansion of sentencing lengths. And that, you know, to understand that, I think you have to go back to what you were talking earlier on about law and order politics, that in the 1960s and 1970s, you know, kind of coming to fruition in the 80s, but beginning much earlier, there's this wave of conservative politicians talking about law and order, law and order. Um, and that, that discourse of law and order politics is not in response to the crime rates. It's in response to protests. It's in response to Black organized and informal rebellion, um, the Black power movement, right? So this, this, this after white flight, this perception uh, in the white suburbs of, of disorder in the cities and the need for law and order is really a, it's a political response in resp that, that is reacting to Black protests. And that law and order discourse that grows and grows and grows and kind of really comes to its 
it's, it's sick fruition in the Clinton administration is really what's responsible for those inc like astronomical sentencing rates, which is why you see when the crime goes down, the incarceration rates still continue to go up, right? Um, and the other thing I would say in terms of integrating these two things is that even if you're talking about the neoliberal offensive and the dismantling of the welfare state, that itself was racialized. That itself was based in an anti-Black rhetoric and anti-Black discourse that that depicted African Americans as undeserving of social programs. And and you know even though at the time of welfare reform most welfare recipients were white women, the depiction of welfare as being a Black issue is what created such widespread voter support for getting rid of these social programs. Right. So even the neoliberal offensive is not itself can't be reduced to class, right? Even the neoliberal offensive in the United States was absolutely racialized and anti-Black from its inception. So thanks. Sorry, that's not a question, but just some comments. <laughs> While we're waiting for the next question, I'll just say, you know, yeah, that's great. I mean, you know, when we look at the 60s, and as I was saying even earlier, we could even look into convict leasing, right, as these ideas, because part of convict leasing wasn't that someone got sentenced to a year and then they did a year on these um, plantation style um, uh, work camps, but oftentimes as um, Douglas Blackman writes in his book, Slavery by Another Name, they were, like I said, entrenched in corruptness that oftentimes as uh, folks were coming up for release, um, they would be rearrested for some kind of nefarious charge, right, that they stole extra pieces of bread on the work camp and then given an additional six months. So oftentimes, um, you know, these convict leasing systems disappear people. And as one thing that Pete and I argue is, you know, that was part of the momentum as well that pushes people out of the South into the North. It wasn't just this idea of looking for better jobs. It was looking for a better way of life. Um, and to your um, um, point around, um, um, neoliberal offensive, absolutely, right? The terms like welfare queen, and then they had to go out and find like that one black woman from Chicago, right? Because there really wasn't any, but there was this one black woman who was taking advantage of food stamps, and they found her, and they made her kind of the the figurehead of uh, of uh, of this synonymous idea of blackness being both morally corrupt as well as uh, criminally prone. So thank you. Yeah, I'll just I'll just second everything that, uh, that Calvin brought up and uh, and also that Lana brought up. You're, abs you're absolutely correct, right? There's no such thing, as, at least in the U.S. context, but probably elsewhere as well. There's no such thing as a purely economic process. And the neoliberal turn itself, I would I would also agree, right? It had its uh, certainly a gender component to it. It had a racial dimension, um, not to mention the sort of nativity or, or immigrant versus you know native-born dimension to it as well. Um, so you're absolutely correct to bring that up. Thank you. Other questions, comments? There was, I believe a question came up in the chat for, uh, uh, from uh, Jim Monique, if I'm saying that right, um, mainly directed towards Calvin, I believe that's, that's his area of expertise, so. So Calvin, yeah, let me know, you. I could, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so I see the question now. So, this is, uh, so the question reads, can you drill down on the issue of the plantation of prison pipeline in Jim Crow? Sure. So, you know, as Pete and I argue, and as I uh, argue as well in, in other work, is that we look at the convict leasing system as really the kind of archetype of, uh, of our modern mass incarceration. And it's that bridge between chattel slavery and uh, mass incarceration, because it really became the way to re-enslave Black people. So the way it would work would be uh, uh, local municipalities would make, you know, really crazy laws like um, no more than four black men can be out uh, uh, together. And if you're out after eight o'clock, that's another type of thing. Uh, so you so curfew. So a lot of um, vagrancy laws come out during um, the post Civil War era. Right. So uh, and we see them uh, persist today where if you don't, if you can't show a residence, then you can be arrested. And so someone would be arrested, they'd be put into jail, then they'd be literally leased out for a, a contract to, um, uh, you know, whether that was public works, because uh, a lot of convict leasing also rebuilt the South after the American Civil War. So building roads, bridges, et cetera, et cetera, as well as to private industries, um, so um, coal industry, timbering, even subcontractors for northern companies like U.S. Steel, and people would, uh, would remain on these places. 
And as, uh, as I said earlier, right, some of these places still remain today. Um, so like Angola, where, uh, you know, it, it went from a slave plantation to convict leasing and now a, uh, a prison, it, uh, it really just shows that, that thread and that theme um, that has never really left the majority of low income and working class black lives and that this our, uh, idea of social exclusion and uh, captivity has been part of the black American experience uh, throughout its history. I have a question. Yes, Lisa, please. Hi, I'm Lisa Witten from Psychology and I really appreciated your presentation. It was very interesting and uh, covered so much ground in terms of explaining where we are now, where black folks are. And I wondered if you, I don't remember when your publication is uh, going live, but have you heard anything from Clegg and his colleague? Um, and, and I wondered if you had an opportunity, it would be really interesting to see you uh, debate them and you know, have an opportunity to interact. So I wondered if, if you've heard from them or others who support their point of view and whether you have, uh, if there will be any chance to talk with them. Uh, thank you, Lisa. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so th th our article is, um, it's, it's, it came out in Spectre, um, which is a, a print publication, but also um, it's, a, it's a nice, nice journal. Um, uh, and it's also online. It's, it's behind a paywall at present. Maybe it'll be um, unpaywalled at some point, uh, hopefully, um, and become more widely available. Uh, we would certainly welcome the opportunity. We've not, you know, spoken or communicated with Clegg or Ismani, um, but we would certainly welcome the opportunity to debate them and uh, have this discussion out in a formal sort of give and take scenario. Um, and they may well um, write, a, you know, a response, uh, inspector or elsewhere following this. Um, so, you know, we should all keep our eyes peeled for that. And we, Calvin and I would certainly, certainly welcome that because that's you know, the best way that discussion can proceed, I think. And I guess I would, I would just add, you know, in some, when I've had students do debates, I've had them try to end with some common ground. And um, you did mention uh, a, a couple points of overlap. Is there anywhere else where you see any common ground uh, that, that you have with um, the other authors? Um, and I'll let I'll, we'll both Kevin and I both speak to this. Uh, I'll, I'll just go first. Um, I would say I remember first reading their article and thinking like being like, oh, cool. Like, like I want like maybe someone's now going to really explore this other dimension that was maybe not as in the forefront of Alexander's work and bring it together. But mm -hmm. I was really disappointed reading the article that it mainly took the tone of an it, basically an attack piece trying to tear down her argument mm -hmm. with what we argue are a lot of sort of pretty flimsy empirical claims and logical claims. So while there's some points that they make that are certainly, I think, largely indisputable that in the aggregate, for example, crime is not the result of just bad people, it's largely the result of desperation and uh, you know, uh, economic marginalization or political marginalization. So those are points we agree with. Um, uh, and that you know, the economic processes and class-related processes had some role to play, sure. Um, but I think, uh, unfortunately, you know, they, they sort of, um, decided to take a rather antagonistic tone uh, mm -hmm. towards uh, um, Alexander's story, which we, we, we believe has actually more to offer in explaining this phenomenon. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just quickly say, I think uh, as Pete rightfully pointed out, that antagonism is very much pointed out in the ways in which they write certain aspects, right? So as the idea of saying that black people just weren't simply absorbed into the labor market or the fact that they try to um, say that, you know, they, and they use it multiple times, this idea of the standard story. And it really is an erasure of the black experience. And so, uh, you know, my argument is that their, their articles steeped in anti-blackness, but because they claim they're from the left, they get a little bit more wiggle room rather than if they were some kind of right wingers, right? Um, so some people on the left might give them a bit of the benefit of the doubt because they claim that, you know, uh, leftist leanings in their politics. But, you know, if this was written by Tucker Carlson or something, we'd be up in arms because there's this idea that what they basically say is that the history of blackness doesn't matter. The history of the black experience doesn't matter. What matters is that in 1965, crime goes up and it just so happened to be black people on the other end of that. So therefore black people um, got the short end of the stick uh, because 
the labor market failed, and then spontaneously, all these local municipalities, states, just happened to say, well, let's just put them all in prison. And, um, but none of them talked, right? That's part of their argument, that none of these um, states and local governments had any kind of conversation, and it just kind of happened organically that way. And we know that that's not true. Um, from a whole host of stuff that both Pete and I argue and other uh, historians, sociologists, political scientists uh, rightfully point out, and other social scientists. Thank you so much, all. So it's it's um, three forty six. I want to leave a few minutes um, for people to kind of get to their other um, Zoom meeting if, if in case they teach a class at, at four forty uh, four fifty. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Peter, for sharing your work. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope we have, I think we do have planned kind of um, several of these wonderful conversations um, over the next, um, at least, you know, over the next academic year, that's what we have planned so far. So I hope many of you join us for, um, for uh, one of our future or for all of our future events. So um, have a good rest of the day, good rest of the week. Um, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.